the master of mankind. He is an emperor, an alpha plus psychic, a corpse on the golden throne, a near godlike entity, and also a tinkerer and an inventor. The emperor of mankind has lived for around 50,000 years and has seen all the ages of humanity, from the Stone Age Anatolian life to the Dark Age of technology. He has been in the shadows, guiding humanity, and when the time became ripe, he emerged out and united the warring techno-barbaric tribes of Terra, continuing on a path that would unite the human worlds all over the galaxy into an Imperium of Man. To achieve this, he had to create armies of superhuman soldiers like the Custodes, the earlier Thunder Warriors, the Primarchs, and the Legionus Astartes. But those were his genetic creations. He also crafted weapons like swords, spears, and armors that were crucial in giving himself and his sons a crucial edge in combat. These weapons are now, in the current timeline, treated as relics and priceless war gear. So here in this video, we will list down 10 of these greatest weapons ever created by the master of mankind. So let's get to it. The first one, the Apollonian Spear. In the center of the Emperor's first citadel, raised before the Unification Wars, surrounded by a pentacle, within a circle, within an octagon, lies a lone black anvil that seems to swallow every essence of light that falls upon it. It is here that the Emperor created the spear that he would later give to the first ever Captain General of his custodies, to Constantine Valdor. This weapon is called the Apollonian Spear, one of two great spears forged by him for his most loyal creations, the other being the Dionysian Spear. This one, the Apollonian, resembles the guardian spears that all the other custodies wield, but it is more than that. It of course incorporates both a power blade and a built-in bolter weapon, but its power and effectiveness far exceeds those of the others. It has an eerie ability to reveal the truth behind everything it penetrates to the wielder. The Emperor created this specifically for Valdor, not to enhance his already great powers, but for the wielder to check it. Killing has been made easy for you, so it will do you good to be reminded of the soul stories of your victims before you end them. Such were the words of the Emperor to Valdor. Valdor has used this weapon quite often against his enemies, against the enemies of the Imperium, and the truth that had been attained from the thousands of souls slain by it has sometimes overwhelmed the great warrior. For example, during the final battle of the Horus Heresy on the Vengeful Spirit, he managed to stab Abaddon with it, and a vision of the future 10,000 years of the Imperium and the galaxy poured into his mind, forever changing the grim emotionless figure that is Valdor. It is believed that after that, Constantine Valdor departed the Imperium and left the Apollonian Spear back in terror. So it lays there, awaiting its owner in a secret chamber within the Imperial Palace. The second one, the Dionysian Spear. This is the other great spear crafted by the Emperor within the Sanctum Forge of his first citadel. The twin sister of the Apollonian Spear. This is the Dionysian Spear, also known as the Spear of Rus later on, as it was given to him by the Emperor during the Great Crusade after the end of the Wheel of Fire campaign against the Orcs in the Eastern Spiral Subsector 4. Also known as the Wolf Spear, it was initially used sparingly by Rus as he was more fond of other types of weapons. It is said that his spear contains a tiny portion of the soul of the Emperor and with this comes a special power, which is quite opposite to that of the Apollonian Spear. While the weapon of Valdor can give the wielder insight into the truth of the victim's souls that it pierces, the Dionysian Spear does quite the opposite. It imparts truth to the victim that it pierces. Ross hated the weapon until he used it on himself and then learned about the truth behind the nature of the Primarchs and also himself. In Wolfsbane, Ross and Horus was locked in a duel and during the fight, Ross managed to stab Horus with it. With the truth inside of it, uh, powered by the soul of the Emperor, at least a shard of it, it transferred some truth into Horus, badly wounding the War Master but also cleansing him of a lot of the chaos corruption, thus restoring a measure of sanity to Lupercal. But this, of course, wasn't enough to change a thing to Horus Lupercal. The Wolf Spear seems to have been used three times against Magnus as well, by Wolf Lord Garm, by Ragnar Blackmane, and then lastly by Eagle the Iron Wolf. I'm thinking that by now it should have been known as the Magnus Bane. The third one, World Breaker. He turned his head, looking to the black iron arms of the throne. His eyes moved over the bronze of a maze as tall as a mortal man. It was called World Breaker 
and he had accepted it from his father's hand along with the title of War Master and command of the Great Crusade. Although it is a powerful piece of weaponry created by the master of mankind, it was more of just a larger type of maze and did not possess any kind of special powers like the twin spears of Valdor and Ross. It was still used to great effect by Horus during the heresy, but by this time, the maze was powered by the machinations of the warp and the ruinous powers. After the heresy, it was destroyed by Abaddon when he faced up against a clone of his former master Horus, who swung the world breaker against the despoiler but was caught in the grip of the talents of Horus and it was caught by Abaddon and in its grasp, Abaddon destroyed the world breaker by simply closing his fist. Number 4. The Regalia Resplendent This is an ornate artificer armor worn by the Primarch Sanguinius and was personally given to him by the Emperor who made it himself. It is a slender power armor, much different from the bulky Terminator and power armors worn by the other Primarchs. This armor was smoother in shape and was golden in color much like that of Dawn and the Emperor. It had openings behind it so as to allow the wings of the Great Angel to come out of. It was personally tailored by the Emperor to Sanguinis' form and it gave the Primarch of the Blood Angels with protection of the highest degree while also still allowing the Primarch to move freely in flight. Number 5. Another type of armor his one true armor. This is the golden Oromite armor that the Emperor of Mankind wore during the Great Crusade and up to the end of the heresy. It became a relic that has now been stripped into countless pieces and each piece has been fitted into each of the thousands of Terminator suits of the Space Marine chapters. It's plausible that he personally crafted his own armor, his own self-artificed armor, which could have surpassed even those of the most advanced pieces of technology in the Imperium. Although, if you think about it, his armor might just have been purely ornamental, with his true strength lying in his psychic abilities and intellect, rendering physical armor redundant. But it is stated that it has been made of Oromite, an alloy that is stable enough to contain immense psychic powers and allowing the user to wield it, and it is durable enough to shrug off even nuclear strikes near the vicinity of it, as was described for the durability of the custodian armors, which are also made of the same material. Along with the body armor is the Emperor's Lightning Claws, which we can agree is part and parcel of the armor unlike the shield and the sword. Number 6. The Emperor's Shield Part of the war gear of the Emperor himself during the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy, along with the sword, the bolter and the armor, it was created by the Emperor for his own use in uniting the human race that has spread all over the galaxy. It was his own personal shield, and this item was lost during the events of the Siege of Terror. But now, as we see in the lion, the son of the forest, Lion L. Johnson, before he fully awakened from his death-like state, he forest walks into a mirror Caliban, which is sort of like an alternate dimension or rather a pocket dimension which the Watchers in the Dark call home. And there he discovers the Emperor's shield along with a sword called Fealty, which he takes back with him to the Material Realm. The shield is sort of like a vibranium in that it can deflect or reflect the enemy's attacks right back at them. And this was seen clearly when the lion battled Angron on Wormwood in the Arts of Omen. The lion also used the shield to decapitate Angron and banish him back to the warp. And as of now, it is in his hands, in the possession of the firstborn son of the Emperor. Number 7. The Emperor's Bolter So as stated in Master of Mankind, the Emperor himself created the Bolter. He did not create the Bolter as a concept but the Bolter was a weapon for the Space Marines. The concept was probably older than the Imperium and probably in use during the Dark Age of Technology, but as a piece of equipment to be used in the Unification Wars and so on, the Emperor's Bolter was the genesis of it all. It was the one that all the others had to be fashioned from. This weapon lacks a name and thus can be called as the Emperor's Bolter. Common sense, right? This particular weapon was black and bronze and was not a relic of the Dark Age of Technology but rather one of the Emperor's own machinations. Due to the Emperor's immense size and the need for super weapons, this bolter could theoretically deal damage a hundredfold greater than those of normal bolt guns. It could very well have the same power output as a mega bolter. Number 8. The Emperor's Sword This is of course the one and only sword wielded by the Emperor of Mankind himself. The same one that he created and used throughout his campaigns in the Great Crusade and also to battle with the chaos juiced up Horus in the Vengeful Spirit. After that, it was retrieved and kept in safe stasis by Belisarius Call until the resurrection of the Primarch Rebooty Gilliman after 10,000 years of a death-like state. 
This sword has many strange powers including the ability to change in size to fit the current wielder, i.e. Gilliman. It has the ability to permanently kill demons and not just banish them to the warp. So most greater demons would flee from it since this would mean their ultimate demise. Infused with the Emperor's own psychic power, this expertly crafted sword is illuminated from hilt to tip by flickering flames, and when it is swung, the blazing blade cuts through even the thickest of armors effortlessly, leaving fiery trails in its wake. In one instance, the Emperor drew his sword pointing it at Magnus, who is arguably one of the most powerful human psychers beside himself, and Magnus couldn't move his body, stuck in place by some kind of power. So the true extent of its abilities is however debatable as it wasn't able to obliterate Mortarion when Gilliman stabbed him in his chest uh, during Godblight. Maybe its true power is only unlocked when wielded by the Emperor himself. Number 9. The Titan Sword Also known as the Mind's Edge and the Life Drinker, this exquisite blade is a nemesis force weapon forged by the Emperor during the Unification Wars on Terra and was wielded by one of his unnamed generals during that time period and the Great Crusade as well. As with all the Nemesis Force weapons, to unlock its full power, the blade must be psychically attuned to the user. It is a relic that is revered as one of the most potent weapons against chaos within the Grey Knights chapter right now. During the Siege of Terror, Malkador the Sigilite bestowed it upon Janus, the would-be first Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights, and since then, it has been passed down to each successive Supreme Grand Master. Currently, as of the present timeline, it is wielded by Kaldor Drago. Its name, the Titan Sword, is actually coined by Janus as it symbolizes the Grey Knight's ties with the Moon Titan of Saturn, which is the training grounds and the genesis of their chapter. It is debatable, however, as to whether this weapon can permanently kill the Neverborn, which means demons, or just banish them back to the warp. And number 10, the Lion Sword. Wielded by the Primarch Lionel Johnson of the Dark Angels, this was a legendary blade crafted on Terra by the Emperor's own artisans, of course under his command and guidance. For it was meant for his first son, the Lion of Caliban. This sword is a one of a kind as it glows with an inner light seemingly appearing to have a soul of its own. And it has the ability to cut through even the toughest of armors and ignite anything it strikes with a powerful flame. During the events of Imperium Secundus, during the Horus Heresy, Lion used it to duel with Conrad Kurz, who even with the cognitive foresight could not fend off the Primarch of the Dark Angels, a swordsman of extreme skill that he could change his strikes mid-air and movements halfway through. So the sword could effortlessly cut through Kurz's nightmare mantle, his artificer armor, and also burning him with the inner fire. The Lion Sword was in the same storyline broken in half over the knee of Gilliman when the Lord of Ultramar learned of the Lion's use of weapons of mass destruction upon Makrak to flush out the Night Haunter. Anyway, the sword was later reforged again on Terra after the heresy, but as of now, it is widely believed that the Lord Cypher of the Fallen may be carrying this reforged sword for some unknown intents and purposes. This is of course confirmed when Cypher met with Gilliman who was captured on board a Blackstone Fortress right after he was awakened. And immediately, the multitasker Gilliman recognized Cypher as the son of the lion, as well as realizing that the sword he was carrying was the lion sword, for it was the same sword he broke in half during the events of Imperium Secundus all those years back. So with that, we come to the end of this video. The 10 weapons created by the Emperor of Mankind. <laughs> if you want to browse for other Warhammer content, then check out our channel. Subscribe, like for support. And while you're at it, bang on the bell icon like you bang your chick every night. <laughs> Till the next time, take care, boys.